Hello, everybody, in another episode of the Public Goods Podcast. I'm really excited to have a fellow colleague of mine, James. Uh, to He is the director of the New York Builders Cooperative and also a council member at BuildOut. That's one of the reasons why we're wearing construction vests with our dot near names on it. Uh, we don't uh, actually uh, remodel homes. And so, yeah, there's a lot of things I wanted to talk about um, today. We're going to go over it pretty soon. Um, you know, James has an extensive experience working with protocols, um, working with communities, building, working with builders, and in fostering builder communities, and also uh, doing things in, uh, you know, the localized region in, in New York where, where he's at. So there's a lot of interesting perspectives that I'm passionate about that I could learn from James and that I've already learned working with him uh, for these past uh, I think couple years now. And so, yeah, welcome to the show, James. Thank you very much. Really glad to be here. Yeah, and, and can you kind of first, you know, I, I like to understand the background of people and why they got into like the builder space or even public goods. And if you want to kind of give a brief introduction on like how you got kind of green pilled into blockchain and started working a little bit about that evolution. Yeah, it was back in 2016. I was an entrepreneur trying to help artists. And we were trying to decentralize YouTube at the time, not knowing anything about Ethereum. And, and that was my journey, discovering DAOs and, and how to decentralize our company. Uh, that's how I got into blockchain. So it was around then, the entrepreneurial spirit led me to you know, be really interested in building stuff always, uh, thinking about community as a new profession I didn't really know about. Um, that's that's kind of like how I got my first real job in crypto after being a startup founder for three years. In 2019, I, I joined a project as a community manager. And, and that's really how I, I kind of made my way uh, after doing the startup thing for a little bit. Uh, but we learned a lot in, in that uh, three year span, um, just, you know, kind of exploring the idea of curation markets and uh, mechanism design you know, token engineering, things like that. So, yeah, I would love to love to learn because I'm, I'm in, in the founder spot as well, have been in the past, but especially with building decentralized, if you guys were trying to decentralize YouTube, we're trying to decentralize public goods funding and impact. You're also pretty big contributor and then, and then build out into potluck. And so I love learning from other founders. So from that kind of three year experience, like what what are what's kind of the main takeaways if you would have done things differently or uh yeah that you learned from from like the, the founder experience in terms of the founder experience i think what i'm taking away from that three-year journey is just ability to weather storms and and kind of stay the course it's really important to navigate ups and downs you know it's a topsy-turvy um you know very roller coaster type of experience when you're a founder so I think we managed to run it for three years, which I was proud of. I think we could have done a lot of things better, but in general, just being able to, you know, handle the the downturns and and really uh, maximize the the upswing. Um, anytime we're building momentum, uh, that's crucial. I I guess another thing I learned is uh, thinking it would be like okay, we get a hundred users, then a thousand users, then we get you know. 10,000 users and so on, but just getting one user at a time was really difficult. And, um, you know, each one of our users was a connection that we had to build and, and we we really uh, wanted to care about our, our users. And, and that's something I, I took away from that experience. And it's all about community. Um, that's what I learned. Yeah. And so, um, like, I, I want to go, go a little bit, a little bit like more, more into that, because like having a company in you know, 2016, 2017, the technology stack was different. And like actually interacting with the user took a level of community, took a level of onboarding and really, um, re really actually engaging. So, so what was kind of the, 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 the tech stack looking like? Cause you were looking at the DAOs 2016, 2017. I mean, that's, that's relatively early in the DAO tooling landscape. Um, and so like how, like, what were you kind of really building and what, what did that uh what did that tech stack look like uh in the in the for the users back then so we can kind of snapshot to 
where we are right now with smooth onboarding. Yeah, that was like back in the day when when Truffle was new and and it was like a cool thing with ganache on Ethereum uh, for kind of like local development. Um, so I think we've, we've come a long way with Hard Hat and Third Web and, and other tools uh, available now. Um, I, I think you know we also had to deal with limitations around the token standards. So we actually introduced a new token structure that uh, we were using and it wasn't even compatible with mainnet Ethereum. So that really made our lives uh, you know, more challenging just to get adoption of a new blockchain that accommodated this multi-token standard. Um, so there was a lot of interesting lessons learned in that uh, you know, exploration into the new structure. Uh, that was before ERC 1155 which is kind of like the current multi-token standard on Ethereum. So uh, we were trying to figure out, you know, how things worked and uh, what you can do with tokens more than just, you know, a number in a, a database, you know, on a blockchain, essentially. And uh, it's actually how I, I got connected with uh, our, our mutual friend, Matt, uh, Matt Lockyer, because he was building this other uh, token standard it was like erc 998 for composable tokens um kind of like a parent and a child token um so that was really the 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 fun thing about it was you know just feeling like we were tinkering with some of the the core primitives and and really you know trying to build something that anybody can use and um it was so new that nobody was really using anything that was like before uniswap or you know uh, a lot of the cool stuff that exists today um so DAOs were <laughs> just telegram groups <laughs> that's what we used to joke about yeah yeah and it, it's it's crazy to see the, the 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 progress that's been made in standards big shout out to matt if y'all don't know him he also was one of the co-authors of the nft standard in the near ecosystem and also built uh like Keypalm, which is essentially an, an onboarding protocol that we use uh to this to this day so big big shout out to him uh but that makes me it, it honestly gave me a little bit of ptsd some post uh token stress disorder um especially because we are uh still in the process of uh the multi-token uh standard on near uh but actually interacting like that that's a very unique position to be in is like pushing standards forward and uh pushing working with open source communities so that uh, you can actually push the whole ecosystem forward so that your implementations can then be adopted into the wider ecosystem. And and that's a very interesting experience in itself. Like, I think that's like a kind of a precursor to what is being done at uh, BuildDAO. Yeah, so we had a little bit of an interruption, just like building, there are bugs. Um, there was phone that overheated, but you are viewing, you're viewing James live from the fridge. Uh, so shout out, shout out to the hacks, the quick hacks, you know, build out, uh, we're back on track. Uh, but yeah, one of the things I, I was leaving off of is like the idea of creating a new, you know, token standard before actual Uniswap and before 1155, like that is the most deep, I feel like you can get on interacting with the protocol and interacting with like a developer community that doesn't really exist. Uh, well, it exists in other places, but it, it doesn't, it's not in your reality um, it, if you're not actually doing that. So it's like, it's very unique experience to be building with these open source developers in like Web3 and crypto. So I, I wanted to know, like, I, you told me in the past, like your kind of experience is going, I think you're working at Secret and then also um, in other protocols. Like how, how did you kind of take that? idea of working with like open source developers and getting the standard path and how did it translate to actually working on the protocol level and what did that like evolution of community look like well i gotta say the word governance because i remember when i had no idea what that meant you know especially for open source development um ethereum really taught me what that meant i i used to look at the all devs you know the the core devs calls um, on Fridays and be like, wow, like, you know, this is really interesting how all these people are coordinating and building Ethereum together. Uh, so 
that's really how it connects to me. It's like governance requires community for these, you know, decentralized uh, blockchains, you know, the, the protocols to actually work. Um, we need people. So that's, that's where I, I kind of uh, focused. I uh, learned that in my startup and, and I wanted to uh, overcome some of the challenges around privacy. So I joined Enigma, which led to the secret network. Um, plus we have the, um, uh, near blockchain. I, I spent a good amount of time, you know, joined in, in 2020 as a community manager. So those are really the, the three main ecosystems that I participated in. Um, Ethereum was my starting point, Cosmos with secret network and now near, um, I, I did spend some time kind of exploring how to build and, uh, you know, that's kind of what I'm doing now, but community was my, my, uh, foundation, you know, that's my starting point. Yeah. And that's a very interesting, I actually see these networks like come up, like you have the Ethereum, you have the IBC, you have like, you know, the rust wasm based, um, chains and, um, like a lot of the time we have to build that community from kind of scratch, but using the learning, um, from the predecessors. So how did that, like, um, how would you say the cultures deferred or like, what did you learn? Like, what did you have to build in terms of community coming to each ecosystem? Like you were very early on in near, you predated like secret yeah. on the cosmos network. Like what did, what did that look like from like, kind of like day one? Well, I mean, events were kind of like this, the first thing that I learned, um, we did a rare art festival and that was around the first ETH New York. So we, we had this, uh, celebration of NFTs and, um, digital art collectibles. Um, and that was because I had gone to the first ever rare art festival, um, the year before, and it changed my life. So that was kind of involved with my, my journey. So I, I felt like giving back was, was really the strategy. And, and that's how I ended up getting my first real job with Enigma is through that event, um, and bringing together a lot of people to do it as a community event. So it's like, we're doing it together not just like, all right, here's an event and everyone's invited. It's like, all right, let's go make this the best event possible, um, as a community. And then, uh, we used to do committees. So we'd have different committees, uh, almost like departments in the community. And, uh, that's how I got into near is because near had guilds and secret network had committees and we were just tossing ideas back and forth and learning from each other. Uh, I was talking to the, the former head of community and, and we were talking about kind of like topology of networks and how things evolve. So that's, that's where it started. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, at, at, at build out we're, we're, we're building on the, like the, the open web stack and with kind of chain abstraction, but the idea, even like that, all these protocols from the, the, the the early days we're communicating with each other and sharing the learnings, even with Nier and Solana, like being in the same street, um, in the origins and SF, all like, I, I think that's constant, constantly overlooked in kind of these layer one wars and every new roll up popping up. But now it's beautiful to see that like ideas were exchanged early on and there were ne not necessarily experts, but people looking, um, looking to learn and, and really like kind of ecosystems that are competing on the charts were actually um, instrumental in, in shaping how we form. And I think that's one thing, especially new people coming in the ecosystem, like we don't really pay attention to what's going on in the other chains, but from like a, a perspective of a, of a, a near builder and a multi-chain builder, I, I, every time I see another chain do something or succeed, I'm like, okay, that not only something to learn from, but something to, uh, to like celebrate because ultimately we reap those benefits. Um, and yeah, so, so how, uh, what would you, what would you say, like you mentioned events, so, like in terms of like the community of how like initially people were looking at it, there are like events, you were coordinating telegram groups online, like how, what did people initially thought success would look like and how, like we're, we're, we're in the impact season, we're tracking impact right, right now, like how, what would that look like and what have you learned about that evolution of, of effective community or how it was perceived and then how you look at it now? Hmm. I, that's a great question. I mean, culture is everything to me. I, I think it's, it's really hard to change culture. So it's, it's really the, this, the kind of like 
table stakes, uh, but it can be improved. Um, it's just you have to really you know focus on what you control. But when I think about community, it kind of breaks down into three different main like functions or you know values provided um, through community programs, and you know one is onboarding. So you know this is like communication with new uh, contributors, you know, potential um, projects and things like that. Um, education is the next one. So it goes in hand in hand with the onboarding, but, you know, it's, it's a little bit more involved and it's, it's more about knowledge sharing, you know, we're, we're trying to maximize opportunities and, and really it's, it's like that generative aspect. So that's what I like to really emphasize is that, uh, regenerative culture, you know? Um, so when it's generative, that means it's, it's not only like self-sustaining, but it's self uh, propagating, it's self improving and it's self evolving. Um, and then being regenerative means it's kind of doing all those things by nature. So it, you don't even really have to try. Um, so the generative aspect is what makes it so you're getting more people involved and they're getting more people involved. So you're like helping other people to help more people. Uh, so that's how it really grows exponentially. Um, and then the final piece of the puzzle here is really the most important. In my mind, it's all about coordination for alignment. You know, we're, we're doing this to minimize risks, you know, reduce, um, you know, any kind of unnecessary complexity or, or duplication of efforts, you know, uh, so we can, we can work together toward the, the shared goals that we have. Um, so that's, that's kind of like, my breakdown of, of the three main reasons for focusing on community is all those. Yeah. And I, I know she's like champions of the ecosystem, like much like yourself. And I even have a pretty guilty of doing this because we're interfacing with a lot of the community, that initial onboarding and that, um, that can look like in a bunch of various different forms. Like that can be in the form of you're onboarding a new project, but that project may be a, an integration partner or they may be someone who can build critical infrastructure. So there's, you know, the idea of not duplicating those efforts, but there is also the idea of like, what if this is beyond my scope or beyond my department and I have to interface with, you know, uh, different teams that normally would be siloed. So how, how would you like early on, especially when I feel like a lot of people, community people, they get those initial inbounds. Like, how do you, how do you interface with like the BD aspect of it or the DevRel aspect of it? And like, do you find yourself wearing multiple hats even in those like early days at, at Near and Enigma? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a classic problem for community professionals. I think you have to be the face of the proverbial company to the community, right? Uh, but you're also the face of the community to the company. Uh, so you have to do both and it's, it's a balance, you know, um, you're not only gathering feedback, but you have to make sure it gets implemented. And, uh, I think with, you know, ecosystem development and, you know, business development kind of pathways, um, it's building connections. And, and so a lot of it is managing relationships and knowing people. So it's just a matter of growing that leadership and, and capability to develop like real opportunities into, you know, projects with adoption and, and real, you know, value, so, so to speak. Um, I think that's, that's a tough problem. I, I think it's, you know, something where people say, all right, well, we just need to point everyone to the same direction and send them to the same place. But the problem is that if you try to do that, you're not really catering to individual needs. And then if you try to, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, if you try to personalize it for every opportunity, uh, then nobody knows where to go because everyone, everyone's different. You know, everything is, is uh, unique. So it's a challenge. I, I think it's just about really understanding people and, you know, asking them about their goals, understanding, you know, where they're coming from. And the more you do that, the more you build trust and, and then they come back, you know, uh, that's what you want. You don't want it to be like following up and, you know, more of a, a burden on them. It's, it should be more of like a value provided and, and a, an opportunity they're pursuing. 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like there's sometimes two different methodologies, and you see it with like the nature of of the call. Well, not really two, but here I I know Ozzy from OFP described that we had like a meeting once about like how to set up the evolution of a layer one and how to basically build community around there. And there is like the idea that you need these primitives, you need these on wraps, you need DAO tooling, you need token standards, you need uh, you know currency adoption, and then uh, and then you have the idea of like you know like network states on top of that, like the first kind of fundamental base layer uh, and then enables a whole new set of applications for an ecosystem um, to build on. And so an approach to that is like, you know, you naturally find people that come inbound, you, you know, they build the projects, you have a more decentralized approach. Another approach to that is you basically as the state, as the layer one, as the foundation, as the labs, as the associated guilds, you say, hey, um, these are what we need, and then you actively field for this teams or signal to everyone like these are what we want to build in this phase to enable the next level. Um, and then uh, there is the also the idea a lot of people do, and especially more like kind of startup lean type of teams um, build all that initial infrastructure in house, and then kind of continue um, to build that. So um, that's yeah. Th this these are kind of trade offs I'm having in. In, in my head, like, okay, do we meet everyone where they're at and let them build and be passionate about what, what they build and they continue that? Or do we need to set down this foundation, um, which I see, I mean, like most people from every layer, where they usually build a wallet, they usually build the indexer, they usually build the explorer, and then you kind of have these um, transition periods. So how do you, how do you, how do you balance like, like, like that? Like, like, okay, this is what people want to do. And then this is actually what is needed for the evolution of this ecosystem from like where we're at which is a very early age startup at this point yeah that's a great question because i think it is easy to believe you know all right if something's working then we don't need to do anything else uh, so we can double down on the more centralized approach if it's working and i think it it does work and maybe it works better uh i think it, it does uh so this idea that we need to rely on like one business development or ecosystem development team uh, is is not a bad idea, but I think it it just loses sight of that function we're talking about with onboarding and um, that generativity. So that the idea that we want to be open to these these new opportunities that come through the door, um, and if we over index on that belief that you know something's working, so we should just focus on that. Uh, we might miss opportunities and uh, community is a big opportunity in my opinion. So when you think, all right, well, we got to send everybody to the same place, then it suddenly becomes a bottle bottleneck uh, in, and they can't, they can't deal with everything. You know, there's, there's too much. So they have to focus on the ones, you know, the deals or the, the opportunities they're, they're generating, you know, the ones they care about most or the ones they know, um, the people they know. So that's good you know, that's their job, uh, but it's just the bottleneck. So the more we can do that as a community, the better we can actually support new contributors and these, these like potential projects that come through the door and they're looking for help or they're looking for information or, you know, some kind of, you know, any, any anything that, you know, they, they just want to know who's out there, who's in the near community, who's here to help, who's going to use what I built. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's just worth remembering that even if we have this great machine for business development, uh, there's like all kinds of you know cool stuff happening in the community that we might forget or we might lose uh, if we don't we don't uh, intentionally prioritize that as well. So it's like another another source of all these great you know ecosystem uh, values, like all the all the projects that come out of it. Yeah, and and there's yeah there's there's been attempts to basically kind of decentralize so that there are not these bottlenecks. You're 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 almost a near historian where you've been you know through the near ecosystem before me, and and you were around for initial guilds and a lot more experimentation, and where you could like can, can you and and now um, you're also part of the governance work group in some capacity at the NDC, which was, if y'all don't know what the NDC is, the NDC is the near digital collective. Um, there's a near foundation, the foundations of blockchains, they usually allocate the treasury to build out the ecosystem, uh, but they're usually 
kind of a corporate structure. They're, they're a nonprofit. And there's idea of the near de decentralized collective where essentially it's a DAO of DAOs with various bodies that have their checks and balances. And in order to kind of set this up, there was another DAO that basically come up with the elections and, and how this would be structured, uh, I think started well over a year ago. And so you were around uh, in terms of like the, the initial start of like how the guilds rolled out and then also how uh, the governance work group rolled out. And now in the, in the actual V1 being live, part of one of those kind of new guilds or DAOs um, and working with a bunch of other grassroots DAOs that are on the receiving end. So I think you have a pretty good like spectrum of what exactly, um, like what, what, have, what have been the changes and kind of attempts, especially uh, pertaining to the NERIC system on wanting to uh, decentralize. Um, but yeah, I would, love to, I would love to learn a little bit more ar like around the guilds and then kind of what you see is done better or what's changed in this current system, uh, just so we have that context. Yeah, so I, I didn't start the guilds program. I uh, came around when we were just getting the community fund started. Uh, we just launched the forum and I was managing the discord when I first joined near. Uh, so guilds were an existing program and, and there were several, you know, really interesting guilds sort of like narrative or like if, if I had to say like uh, what what my goal was, you know, it was really like a strategy to get people using the technology that we're we're talking about. So we can talk, talk, talk about near all day. But if, if we're not actually using it, then we're not going to drive adoption. That was my sort of like driving like principle. Um, so when we talked about guilds, a lot of them were off chain. They were using things like, you know, telegram groups. They, they were on discord, you know, and the, these are great tools and people use them all the time still. Uh, but the idea was that they weren't using the blockchain, you know, they, they weren't using near. Or at least, you know, some of them were, but they weren't getting more people to use near. They were just getting more people to use their Telegram or their Discord. So that's kind of like my whole thing was like almost turning guilds into DAOs or getting guilds to use DAOs, however you think about it. It's sort of like a way to get them using on-chain tools for collaboration. We introduced the, the Sputnik DAO contract. Um, you know, that was at ETH Denver and uh, the virtual ETH Denver 2021. And then uh, that became Astro. So, uh, you know, over the course of my time with Near Foundation, we, we uh, grew that, you know, DAO community from just a bunch of off-chain telegrams to, you know, a lot of DAOs on-chain. And, and so, it all comes down to resources and you know funding and and that's a big topic right so um the benefits of using the blockchain in that regard or transparency you know you get more accountability so you can see like oh this is how much they got for that project or you know um they actually did pay that person or whatever um so the idea is really just about that um, openness too, so you can join. So it's not just about transparency, but being able to get involved freely and just if you're there to contribute. If you're not there, kind of maliciously, then then you're you're welcome to to be part of it. Um, and then using that to like really like improve what we're building. So like gathering user feedback and and testing products and like you know identifying problems. That's what really makes open source work so so there's a lot of that in terms of devrel you know trying to get real users and, and builders to share but yeah i, I think it, there's a lot of a lot of uh a lot of ways to answer that you know it's it's a big question for sure yeah and and, and just like i mean a lot of people i mean are, are maybe building a traditional organization i mean you got into the space exploring a lot of that that dao thing but that that in that concept of actually onboarding existing organizations and transitioning to a DAO is is is, is an amazing kind of experience, and, and that I, I 
I would love to learn a little more about that. But even on the potluck side, like we're we're building tools now, you can track where funding is going to. Um, but we're in the phase of actually, um, you know, seeing the impact, and so and and actually quantifying that impact and allowing people to attest and. Um, just from my experience in the near ecosystem, auditing the whole ecosystem in terms of like the projects and the builders and things like that. There, I mean, to be honest, we've had like a a a bad name in the street, even with you know the Gills program and the Grants program for not the best effective use of capital. And so, um, yeah, I I wanted to kind of understand like what was uh like I a little bit more about like what were people doing as DAOs? Because even initially, a lot of people like, I want to bring users, but they may not have the applications that like, fit the specific use case. Um, outside of just payments and putting bounties up, like what type of DAOs were kind of emerging at this, at this time? Uh, who, who were the champions there? And then uh, a little bit about like what, uh, how things could have been done uh, more efficiently or like why that, that program was uh, wound down. So, I, I mean, it's definitely not even wound down, so to speak. I mean, it's just been transitioned over to NDC because, you know, Creatives DAO and Marketing DAO were part of that program. So there was also the Community Squad. That's how it started. Uh, so really the first guild to use DAO stuff uh, was from Mintbase. With, they had a CreateBase, which was like their guild. And then it became the Creatives DAO. Uh, Later, uh, marketing DAO was formed, um, and and that was uh, intended to bolster, you know, community events and and uh, you know marketing efforts worldwide. So, uh, you know, that that was a big part of uh, like the smaller events uh, that we were trying to support around the world. And then uh, we had, you know, this concept of the the ecosystem treasury uh that was discussed and that's kind of what led to ndc so i would also i would just throw it out there maybe it, it's a hot take you know i would think that uh dows help more than they hurt you know like they get a bad rep now i think people look back and they say oh like it was all the dows fault but like in reality the dows made it more accountable and uncovered a lot of the stuff that was happening with guilds just being honest. Uh, so I feel like we look back and we think, oh, wow, those DAOs were bad. But actually the DAOs are what like ended up correcting the problem. So, you know, not every DAO worked out, you know, but I think that a lot of the reasons that we we are now kind of experimenting with NDC is, is because we learned from those experiments. Um, and, and so we're we're empowering community. We are committed to that vision for decentralization. And I think that's really cool. I think that's one of the reasons I love Nier um, is, you know, we're authentically, you know, motivated to decentralize and, and really, you know, give that decision-making power to, to real users and, and people who hold the token and, and you know, everyone involved. Um, even trying to be democratic, that's cool, you know, with, with the I am human soulbound token and, and uh, how how NDC uh, works now, so yeah, I just I think that governance is is not easy, um, and we certainly haven't figured it out. But you know we're making progress, and I think that what we're doing now is is a you know step in the right direction. But I want to make sure that we don't take two steps forward and then three steps back and then one step forward and you know. Um, like I want to keep me, keep moving forward um, and not, you know, miss any of these lessons learned along the way. Um, so one thing we tried to do is we actually did a big research project. It was for the uh, the Governance organization. Um, we we researched like all of the grants that we did through DAOs, and we we came up with the report. Yeah, it was it was soon after that that I I transitioned roles, um, but. You know, the idea was that guilds and DAOs were were at odds uh, because people just didn't want to use the stuff we were building. That's how I felt. And to me, it's like 
a surefire way to, you know, slow things down is if you don't even believe in what you're doing and you're trying to convince other people to do it, like it's never going to work. So, you know, I really believe in the concept of DAOs and, you know, everything we're, we're building. So I've, I've been trying to advocate for that. And uh, to me, it doesn't really matter too much about like what, um, you know, happened with guilds or DAOs. It's just like governance, <laughs> you know, we're learning how to do things together as a community, as a whole ecosystem. And that's yeah, not I'm, easy. Yeah. It's going to take time. I'm a big proponent of like finding, like using blockchain to activate what people are passionate about. And um, yeah, I'm a big proponent of DAOs and using it as a more transparent way to coordinate funding and to make decision making. Um, and yeah, I mean, we're, we're, uh, we're in build out. Uh, and, uh, but, but at this, at the same, at this, at the same time, I think just like any kind of, uh, you know, VC or, you know, investment fund is they have, you know, a particular category and sector that they need to, uh, that they have the best expertise in that will bring them the most returns. And I, I, uh, I, I wasn't entirely necessarily convinced that may maybe the, the basket of DAOs that were initial are, uh, essentially the best. ROI uh, for what we needed as a chain at, at that time. Um, and so I, uh, but like kind of going off of what you learned, I do think there is more transparency there. I do think there was a, a, a even more of a renaissance in DAO tooling uh, than there is essentially maybe even now, which is really just kind of uh, the NDC and then build DAO uh, building right right now. And I, and I would love to see the proliferation of the usage of DAOs, more use cases, and then forks and implementations and added functionality to DAOs so we can kind of do a lot of things that we want to do, like NFT-based DAOs, SPT-based DAOs, you know, token DAOs. I think that's absolutely essential. So if anyone's listening and wants to help build that, that would be dope. But like, there was, like, we talked about the NDC and the transition. There was, like, the governance, the phase. Like, all right, okay, what did we learn here? And then how are we going to design a system that, was democratic and now even these conversations are happening again and so like what were what were your main kind of take in that process of like like i know you were one of the main people attributing but we had our we were there <laughs> like we were we were at the meetings you were there early on um and then what were you what were your main take takeaways like okay we're going to design a governance system that has its own community treasury and like how what was that methodology look like well, it's all about sustainability. I think that's that's what we agreed. You know, that's how I remember it. You know, I guess it's been almost like two years ago now, um, a year and a half ago. Um, so, you know, trying to make sure that we are, you know, doing good governance, which means that we're, you know, that we're open. You know, we, people can get involved. It's it's not some closed group that runs the show. Um, we're, you know, being responsible, which means being effective and efficient with the resources. Um, and, you know, uh, we're being smart. We're, we're being, you know, uh, on chain, we're, we're thinking ahead. So it's, it's not just like, oh, we got to like put out a fire over here or there. It's like, we got to get straight to the source and, and find the big opportunities and, and solve the big problems. Um. So yeah, being strategic, I don't know. I, I think that that's what we're lacking right now is the strategy. Cause it feels like we're just flailing around, you know, the council of advisors was intended to provide a strategy, but uh, it's very vague. I mean, the goals of NDC right now are you know, widening ecosystem adoption, supporting public goods and, you know, governance participation, essentially activating people to get involved with NDC itself. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do in that big, you know, category. Um, I think, you know, that's good, but it's also, you know, necessary to have more strategic initiatives. And, and, uh, even when we're talking about like how to stake these community resources, like that becomes a whole thing. It, it's you know, seems like maybe an obvious or like a, you know, at least a question of like, well, how much should we do that? Um, you know, not just like, 
yes or no. Um, I think most people would say yes. And, you know, well, maybe not all of it or something like that, but it, it seems like we're going to have to deal with, with those kind of decisions in this really involved, like direct democratic way with the voting body. So I just, I want to see more voting on things that are strategic. So it's like, more important when you vote it's not so much voting all the time but more like all right when we vote it really matters and it's about the strategy and then we know all right here's the strategy and then people can do their jobs to achieve goals based on that strategy but right now we don't really have much of a goal outside of like distribute the money <laughs> and then people have to come up with reasons why you know they they are contributing to this like vague mission of NDC, um, which is basically yeah. like, what are you doing for near, you know, and yeah, should yeah. everyone who's helping near get some budget? Yeah, maybe, I don't know. How should we work that out? Yeah, I just want to give some context for people listening. Cause like we talked about the governance work group leading to that point, some of the actual framework that ended up being developed, uh, were that they were, there's essentially a trust, a trust system that has the community treasury, that community treasury up to now, based on the price of near, which, you know, uh, technically going up, I don't speak on the price, but it's going up. It's around, uh, like 35 plus million in that, in that treasury initially. Um, and essentially there were three body, there was an election that happened and the way that it was, there was an OG SBT committee and there was these group of OGs that it's funny to describe now, but this really happened and we witnessed it happen for almost a year. But yeah, there were these OGs and there was a committee and they were basically, you would apply to be an OG through a form. And then the DAO would actually mint you with SBT. So there was a formation of a soul bound token standard in this time. And they would mint you an SBT. And then if you have the OG SBT, then you could be like, Hey, I want to vote. I want to run for three bodies. And it was just like kind of how we do uh, the legislative, the judicial and executive, right? There were literally three bodies with checks and balances. And there were the House of Merit, which actually takes in non proposal, they had 15 seats. Then there was the Transparency Commission, I think they have seven seats. And then uh, Council of Advisors 11. So the Council of Advisors can veto things that come into the House of Merit after they're approved, and they kind of set the agenda. The Transparency Commission can be like, yo, there's collusion going on. I'm going to set a report and I can actually revoke people from there. So there was actually a creation of these contracts that I could fork each other and have cooldown periods to accommodate um, with this. And so there was an election and to actually vote, you had to be a human. And, and, and this goes on to what's going on right now. It's like, was this the best method? Um, we're using, you know, human verification on the not about side. And you might've seen like, I am human. So basically, you know, Fractal, they have this service. Um, there's the guys who also make IDOS where you scan your face and then they built essentially a relayer and a way to mint SBTs from that API so that you can like prove that you're a human. And when you're a human, you could vote. And there was over 5,000 humans that were verified and a bunch of people voted. The voting was not private. I would get messages. I was running that like, Hey, I can't vote for you because I got to vote for this. Like block. It, it got really political and we were building widgets and components live time to see that happen. And it was, yeah, it was, it was a pretty incredible experience. So like the, the current in, incumbent body are essentially the house of merit and the, the, the three bodies are, uh, uh, they are the people elected from that first election. I think it happened back in fall. And there's going to be a new election coming uh, back up and they're deciding, okay, well, they're, they're, what voting mechanism should we do? Should it be human? Should it be stake weighted? Should there be a threshold? That's what um, James was alluding to. Uh, but they actually have amounts they can spend uh, whitelisted or like sanctioned by the, the trust. And then people, different DAOs and people can directly fund uh, called grassroots DAOs. They tend to apply for funding for, to the House of Merit the House of Merit approves and sends that to the trust, and then the trust funds accordingly. And a lot of these DAOs are basically on a, a monthly kind of basis where they report transparency through a governance forum that's being transitioned to kind of a more on-chain uh, type of thing. Um, but uh, they're, they're basically, you know, seeing what they do, they have like OKRs and they submit it monthly and they're asking for funding uh, this way. That's kind of the, the state of uh, the, the play. So, yeah, it's it's a lot. If I tell people from other ecosystems, like what? Like, like they, yeah, just even that, listening that, that to you now, like, I'm like, I don't think I understand it. Um, yeah, it's a lot. Uh, 
I, I just want to say the the point I'm trying to make here is is not, you know, like, oh, you know, governance is impossible. It's it's really that we need to be strategic. And I think that what we're doing now is is more so optimizing for governance. And it's like maximizing the governance rather than minimizing the governance. So we're actually wanting more proposals from from all around and and it's better if we we just kind of like spray and pray um whereas i think it would make more sense if we trusted the grassroots styles to make decisions so it's not like we have to approve proposals twice because that's how it works right now is we get proposals to the grassroots style we review them you know um we either approve or, or reject them and then we have to go to the Congress again after already getting approved for the total budget, you know, and, and get those proposals approved by them. So it's like a double um, approval that we have to do right now. So what we want to do is move toward more of like a planning focused approach. So it's more about the grassroots styles planning their projects and coordinating different projects and, and uh, making sure they have what they need um, in a proposal, just one proposal that gets approved. So it's not, it's not double, but yeah, I, I just wanted to go off for a second there. Cause I think we get lost in like, oh, governance is hard, you know, but we can be really focused on specific interventions, you know, changes to make so that we can be better. And, uh, I think that's one way to be strategic is, you know, empowering the actual grassroots styles to, to get stuff done. Because right now it's a lot of work for the grassroots house to yeah, and in, and in being involved in like I also am a voting council member allegedly on on the build on Bill Dow as well. Being involved in a lot of DAOs, which are grassroots DAOs, um, like I I would say you know Bill Dow has one of the strongest communities, um, and you yourself abstract a lot of that the governance pain points where I see a lot of DAOs generally get frustrated, especially when you're going kind of month to month. Um, and I love the methodology that you like, we actually do need way more inbound. People don't realize this is like a funding source. So that's another thing too. But, uh, how do you like, let's kind of give a little bit like a context of like what, what build out is. So like, like we're wearing builder gear. We don't do construction. Like what, what exactly is build out? How did it form? And then we can kind of go into the context of like NEC and how it fits. Yeah, so BuildDAO is a member-owned collective support system and resource hub for builders. So we're builders helping builders. That's our motto. And, you know, we have our uh, supportive legal entity, Near Builders Cooperative, that handles operational and, you know, administrative responsibilities, kind of tangentially or you know adjacent to the the DAO. So it's using this model of a, a cybernetic organization or a cyborg, um, a Borg as as they say. Um, and this is a general pattern. It's kind of like a, a framework or an approach for you know legally you know supporting DAOs. And that means build DAO is more like a movement and the cooperative is more like the organization that supports all of the builders who are building everything together. So that's really what it's about. Um, you know, build DAO builds and the cooperative supports builders. And so for people who like to build and like DAOs, like why haven't they heard of build? Like, so there's this yeah. idea, like we're in the, it's not called near build. It's called near builders cooperative, but it's called build DAO. So can you kind of explain like, what is everything? What are you guys building uh, and like how, how you look at like approaching new people and, and kind of shaping them on their builder journey? Yeah. So, you know, in our book, everyone is a builder and, you know, everyone can level up and, and we're here to help you. So build DAO is a way for you to find what you need to get to the next level. And, and so we're building and we have a lot of projects and you can get involved with those projects. You can earn rewards by contributing to these projects and, you know, 
together we're building a better future, uh, a better internet, uh, you know, more open web. So uh, that's that's really what we're doing. I, I think you know it's important to keep in mind that anyone can be part of build out. All you got to do is build. So you know, put on your hat. You know, uh, start building, and you're a member of build out. Uh, the cooperative is a little bit more specific with regard to membership. You have an actual agreement that you sign um, if, if you want to be a member of the cooperative. Um, and, you know, there's identity verification requirements that go along with that. Uh, plus, we have kind of a minimum level of contribution. So if you're just not doing anything, then, then you're not in the cooperative. Uh, we, can, we can kick you out essentially. Uh, so those are a little bit more strict, but it's very open still. And the idea is that with the cooperative structure, you know, the members actually own it. And in the bylaws of the cooperative, we have stated our, uh, you know, rules, like as a company is, you know, we, we work for the DAO. So the DAO ultimately controls the, the cooperative uh, to an extent of like, you know, not doing something that would go against our, our fiduciary responsibilities to uphold, you know, legal operations. So, you know, we got to keep it legal. So if the DAO says do something illegal, we can't do that as the cooperative, but otherwise it's like we work for, for the DAO. Uh, and, and that's, that's how we set it up. I think it's a really interesting model and it's a template. So you can use this approach yourself if you want to start a cooperative or any kind of organization that can be like a Borg. So it doesn't have to be a cooperative that just brings in the member owned um, and, and governed uh, qualities that we talked about a little bit. Um, but you can just be an LLC and, and still be DAO adjacent like a cyborg or a Borg. Uh, but yeah, I, I went off on that tangent a little bit, maybe maybe too much, but you know, that's that's kind of like the breakdown of the cooperative and, and why, you know, it exists. It's, you know, to pay people, to pay taxes, to you know, handle contracts, things like that. Uh, so we do that on behalf of DAO members and, and we, we listen, you know, we, we work for the DAO. So we're not, we're not operating like, you know, just for our own our benefit. It's for the members benefit, the cooperative members. And then, the build DAO members can be a bigger group. It can be more people than just the cooperative members, but there is an overlap. So I think that's the real question is like, how does that work? You know, are there going to be more cooperatives, more organizations involved with build DAO? Is it just going to all kind of go through the one uh, cooperative? You know, is it going to be uh, something where a lot of the build DAO members are not in the cooperative? Uh, or, or more so like, you know, one-to-one, -one, like everybody is in the cooperative, unless there's some reason why not. Um, but I'll just say that we're taking it slow and, you know, we're not getting ahead of ourselves because we want to build. That's our main focus. Um, so we're not trying to figure things out too quickly. And if you want to help us, you know, we're open to all kinds of feedback. We, we really want to, you know, learn from people who contribute, people who are involved. Uh, people who care about near people who care about the open web, you know, people who care about potluck, people who care about public goods. Um, you know, these are our people. So uh, everyone is welcome to build with us. Yeah. And, 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 and if anyone's wondering where that lives, that lives at nearbuilders.org. There's also a telegram where there's a lot of coordination happening. I'll put that in uh, the, the, the show notes, but I love how you guys approach like, cultivating builders and a lot of times we especially people kind of early on i mean personally like at pot like like build out members help optimize help build new things help do not abide verifications like build out is very involved in contributing to that ecosystem if uh you're using that platform even how we develop on boss like the like boss workspace attestation services uh even future software supply chain. Personally, like when it comes to a lot of the primitives that we intend to use, I look at build out as a place where not only builders will be building that, but they'll be continuing to build and passionate um, to build about and, and a good inbound where they can just get started with building as opposed to like 
other places where it's over governance. There's a lot of proposals, a lot of waiting, maybe people coming in down to the ecosystem that want to get involved, but they need money first. It's it's a really different culture for how build out works, just from what I've seen with I- interacting with uh, almost all uh, you know nodes in the near ecosystem. And so one thing that we get is like, what is all right, but then there's there's DevHub or DevDAO or how does like, what points do you collaborate? Why would someone go to DevHub versus BuildDAO? I mean, there are overlap between the two. There's a lot of DevHub contributors that are in BuildDAO, and so how how does how does that work? And this goes a lot to the, like the not investing in one thing and doing it well, but having kind of these plural systems. Like when when these when these developer related organizations emerge, like how are you guys interfacing with the dev hubs or even other crews like OWA and things like that? Well, we're supporting builders, so you know we want to support DevHub, we want to support Open Web Academy. Um, you know, there's developer DAO from Ethereum, near Dev DAO. All of the above, you know, if you're building, we're here to help you. So we're there to collaborate. Uh, we're we're very open to feedback. You know, um, you're welcome to join our our group, and uh, you can you can do that on chain as well. We have our processes for contributing. We have a planning session every week. We do on chain posts to share updates, and uh, you know we're we're using GitHub a lot. So you know. That's a big part of our workflow as well. You can check it out. Um, you know, the near builders GitHub is popping. Uh, so we're building a lot of cool stuff. If you want to get involved there, uh, I'd say the way it works now, you know, we're really focused on this open web stack. You know, the artist formerly known as Boss, the blockchain operating system, uh, and, you know, uh, everything, which is a type system for building on the open web. And that makes it easier to build anything. So if it helps builders, uh, you know, that's really our focus. We're, we're trying to, you know, home in on that kind of JavaScript um, and, and React uh, developer audience, um, but also just like any creative people out there who, who want to learn and, and, you know, change their lives and, and, you know, take their career to the next phase, you know, um, adding new skills, um, and really discovering their potential. So, yeah, I think it's it's education as a use case. Um, you know, we're we're trying to not only get people involved, like when they walk through the door, but you know, keep them coming back, and you know, help them learn, help them grow, and and really build, um, and and contribute to what we're building. So, yeah, I think that's all uh, me just you know trying to say that we're we're not just the uh, you know onboarding as in you know getting people into the room, um, but you know a lot of times people wonder well you know why should I stick around or you know what's in it for me or, or like who's advocating for the builders and and that's what we're here to do it's it's like a, a labor union for the contributors of of the open web so you know we're here to to back you up and and get you what you need to build. Yeah, and, and and speaking of kind of a support system and like the intersection of how you guys are even contributing to a public good stack, um, we do have um, the first ever retroactive builders round happening in uh, the near ecosystem amongst like the first series of quadratic funding rounds. It's actually the first round tailored to builders. The Creative DAO round and the Africa round just happened. Um, applications are open. I don't know how quick I'm going to edit this, but <laughs> uh, essentially, like we there's over started with 30,000 it's now around 60,000 worth of near I don't I can't say if the price of near went up or not but you uh do the math since uh, the money was put on the contracts and this is to um incentivize you know builders who have built something in near in the past and using quadratic funding to essentially uh give out those rewards so is there anything you would like to speak on that and how how like this is a, an experiment um can evolve yeah, I think it's really cool what Potluck is building and especially how it is, you know, on chain um, fully because you can you can build your own Potluck app using the contracts, uh, leveraging these these open web components, you know, um, on, on the boss, 
Uh, so I, I think that's really cool. And uh, I, I want to see, you know, where this can go with, with more integrations across applications. So building a, a kind of funding SDK or a potluck SDK. Um, and yeah, when, when this uh, podcast drops, you know, I'm sure uh, there will be somewhere to donate. So that's really what I would ask uh, is if you're interested, check it out, donate to a project, you know, open source developers really benefit from your support. It, it means a lot to them and, and uh, it, it keeps us building and it keeps us going. So uh, thank you for all the help. And yeah, I'm really excited about this next phase when we can do more retroactive funding. Yeah, and, and retroactive, like if, for people who don't mean it, means to like fund, fund people after the fact. And a lot of builders who've been building in the past may have, you know, not gotten all the rewards or even uh, they got rewards, but they deserve more because it made such more of an impact. And this is an opportunity um, to show that. Um, and so right now we're in the application period. It's Thursday on Sunday. Uh, and it's going to end Sunday night. So I'll try to get this out before then. But then basically verified humans. And you can verify pretty easily um, using Nadabot. You can actually get your donations amplified with quadratic funding. And you can kind of see that um, in the UI. We'll put notes in the show notes. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's really exciting to see this be done. And yeah, like BuildOut was actually helping optimize it. We had, we had a code review session uh, with Elliot, another council member at BuildOut, where uh, we went over the SDK, we went over a UI kit, um, and even ways to optimize and the type system using a create, create app or app create or uh, whatever nomenclature it is. Um, so you can even easily fork this. So it doesn't just apply to projects. It applies to, to builders in general, or you can, you know, a add your builder hat to the, to the component or add comments to the pot or anything. It's built pretty composably using these decentralized front ends on the open web stack. So yeah, I'm really excited about being able to reward builders and a lot of projects on here are things that we've been using. Um, there's like multi-call, there's uh, like friendly, there's uh, SDKs, there's everything, there's hyperfiles, there's Git Wasm, there's a bunch of more to come. Um, but yeah, a lot of dope projects, um, the highest quality of projects we've done in any uh, rounds. And um, yeah, it's going to be a, a super interesting experience. We've had kind of a lot of other ideas of how to reward builders outside of directly contributing and things like that. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to to provide these kind of plural reward system for uh, builders. And so outside of that kind of call to action and then going to nearbuilders.org, um, like what are, and outside of like the open web engine and then the stack, like what are you, if you like, I mean, I know you're uh, one of the most incredible things about uh, you know, the open web stack and then building in this culture is I've actually seen James merge as a builder and really learn to build it himself. And he's actually shipping components like regularly and building with the builders and there's build time or we used to call it, I don't know what we used to call it. There, it, it just keeps on changing on my calendar, but there's a time where we get together and we build, it's kind of like a stand up and code review and a uh, pair programming session and out there with the builders every day. So like, what are um, you really excited about? Are you personally building that you want to see and that you want to even manifest coming into the ecosystem? Well, I, I think the only way to answer that question right now is to say community. So I'm really excited about building the build out community, you know, uh, all the great builders that I've been learning from over the past year and and some uh you know i can't wait to keep learning more and and, and helping yeah you heard it from mr bill dow himself uh we've become a long way from photoshopping construction hats on on images to having real construction gear right in in, in, fr in front of us so yeah, i'm really excited about what to come i'm really excited about build out actually building tooling that i use that help me uh build faster and also ship to production and also fostering and garnering a community that supports public goods and doing it in a transparent way and doing it in such a, in, in more of a community ground up trust worth way while also building useful things. So now I really appreciate uh, you coming here, James, always a pleasure to learn with you. You've taught me a lot. Uh, and yeah. Um,